Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. We have a great talk coming right up on deck here. Luis, without any further ado, please turn on your camera. I'll have you give a brief introduction, then it'll be all yours. Hi, everyone. All right. <laughs> I'll be here if you need me. Give a holler. <laughs> all right. Hi. Right. Um, let me start my video real quick my slides. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Luis Moraes. I'm a data scientist at Western Midstream. And let's start with a little bit of an introduction, right? What does Western Midstream do? Um, so Western Midstream is a midstream company we're in the midstream business. And what that means is we are one of three parts of the oil and gas industry, right? We're the midstream part, which means we transport product from point A to point B, typically through a network of pipelines. Um, our customers want to use these pipelines to move their product and availability is really important to them. Um, if a part of our network isn't available to our customers, they can't get their product from point A to point B, and that affects their own schedule. They'll have to stop production. Um, essentially, it backs up the whole pipeline. And that is where predictive maintenance comes in. Now, most people have heard of predictive maintenance, at least in the oil and gas industry. And what it means is to spot failures before they occur. Right. We're trying to predict when maintenance should occur so that we can avoid those failures. And by doing that, we can also improve our availability. Um, if a piece of equipment is causing issues, we might need to bring down a facility or bring down some portion of that pipeline network. And that unplanned downtime will affect the availability that our customers see, perceive. Right. And if we are able to predict when these failures occur or when they're most likely to occur, we can plan our downtime and work around it, essentially having it not affect the availability. So what do I mean by first generation analytics? Well, we are in a pretty interesting context building these systems, this predictive maintenance solution. Um, we're in a transitional period. We were previously a small part of a large ENP company, uh, and that stands for exploration and production. We're moving our systems and our data from however it was set up for the ENP company to our own needs as a midstream company. You could say we're building the plane while flying it because operations are ongoing 24-7. You can't really stop operations to gather any baseline data. And that goes back to availability is very important to our customers. Um, and there's no previous foundation to build upon. Uh, we're starting from scratch, building up our ML-based analytics for our equipments and operations. So what are we trying to accomplish? Well, in this presentation, we're going to go over an application of predictive maintenance to pumps in our facilities. And you could think of the actual job to be done is to reduce the monitoring burden on these pieces of equipment, focus attention on where it is needed and provide a basis for decisions, right? So whenever our operations team makes a decision, they can go back and point to what our models told them. So in other words, it's to help triage maintenance efforts. So let's go over the journey, the journey we took before even be we begun modeling, right? So in the beginning, we had no data. What do you do when you have no data? Well, we researched prior work. We looked at how other people have gone about doing predictive maintenance. And a lot of the work available we found um, is not quite applicable to our context. A lot of the work we found requires data of much higher frequency. It looks at um, it, it is usually a spectral analysis of, for instance, the vibrations on a piece of equipment. And since we didn't have data with that frequency available, it's not something we could pursue 
at least right now. However, it did provide a lot of things to think about for future work. So prior work was a bit of hit and miss, gave us ideas, but not really a strong starting point. So we decided to just move on, get the data, see what we could find, right? Now, how do we get the data? Easier said than done. Pulling data from our data historian, and let, I suppose I should take a step back and explain what a data historian is. Uh, a data historian is essentially a time series database. It's a database specifically for a certain type of data that is updated in timestamps. Um, unfortunately, you'll find that there are quite a few quirks when dealing with a historian, right? The first work we found was, well, it's not really a quirk, I suppose, since other databases also have similar issues, is a query limit. So we ran into this query limit and we had to pull data instead of that huge chunk that we wanted, we had to pull it one week at a time and then stitch it back together. So we got that data. And now we run into those issues in dealing with time series data. We needed to align these time series. You can think of each time series as an independent column in a table, but we, we were given the columns all separately and now we needed to put them back together. So the first thing we needed to do was align these time series. And the interesting thing about aligning um, is that you, you now have a new question, right? How do you align it? Um, to what resolution do you align it? So we had data coming in at a variable um, time period. So some data might come in in the next second. The other, uh, another piece of data might come in the next minute. It varied. And we needed to standardize that if we ever wanted to align all of those time series into a single tabular format. What we ended up choosing was a 10 minute interval. It seemed to work for us. It didn't throw away the information, but it compressed the data quite a bit. And yeah, what worked for us might not work for you, might be a different value. Um, however, the data was still noisy. There was quite a bit of work required to trim that data set favoring quality over quantity. There were a lot of segments where the data was either missing or um, it was not updated. So you would see a constant value for a long period of time. And we needed to catch that and remove it from our data set so as not to affect the models we trained. Finally, um, having fixed our data, we needed to obtain some models, some labels, and we did obtain them. However, they were noisy labels and we needed several passes from several people to actually figure out, um, let me just remove this real quick, to actually figure out what we should use as labels. We had to work backwards from work orders, invoices, and so on. And the hope was that having several people look over this data would provide a greater confidence in those labels. So finally, we were ready to start modeling. First, let me take a quick moment to summarize the journey. Well, it was a winding path forward. One thing of note is that in-house development allowed us to circumvent those roadblocks. I could see that there are a lot of issues we would run into that we would not be able to solve if we were if we had a fixed solution right but doing things in-house gave us that flexibility and also the job to be done was critical in helping us determine if we could still reach our destination at every point um, that we encountered an obstacle for instance we have the wrong frequency of data can we still move forward with this project or not was a matter of can we still provide that job to be done even though the wrong frequency of data was available or noisy data was available or noisy labels were available, right? Um, so let's move on to the modeling decisions. <clears throat> now to give 
a bit of an example as to why these decisions were not so straightforward. This is an example of our noisy labels. Is this label correct? It's, I'd say it's pretty hard to tell, right? Because you have something distinguishing this middle segment where to the left and right of it, the data kind of looks the same. Why is this part, this segment, a failure and the rest isn't? Well, um, it could very well be the case that the label is correct. And we tried to verify as much as we could these labelings, but at some point you just had to kind of let the algorithms take it from there and hope that they could deal with the noise. <clears throat> so how do we make good modeling decision when our data is noisy? Well, the path we took was to choose the model that generalizes best. Now that's common sense really, but um, it really gave us a better appreciation right, for this piece of common sense, right? Focus on evaluating future predictions when the model will actually be in use. Um, however your model performs in historical data doesn't really help the bottom line. Look at the right metrics. In our case, the threshold didn't really matter. We cared about how the model looked, essentially, how it would, um, how the output, those scores, the shape, <clears throat> of that output. And so the area of under the curve was what we were looking at for determining which model was best. Um, also hedge your bets whenever you can. We were trying, we, we sampled where appropriate to control skew in data availability and quality. So for instance, if some facility is having more issues than another facility, make sure that you uniformly sample among the facilities so that one of them does not overcrowd your training. And also we displayed predictions of more than one model, also hedging our bets there. So um, modeling is only one component. We wanted to provide something that the user well, could use. We wanted to improve its usability, right? And seeing something like this, it isn't very apparent what to do about it, right? <clears throat> so what you see here are the predictions of one of our models. Um, and you can see it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't smooth in its predictions. You have a lot of spiky behavior at times, and that doesn't really help in the sense that it doesn't give us a warning for when things are trending downwards, trending towards failure. Although here, um, a higher value is more indicative of failure. So the first thing we did was to smooth this data. And if we smooth the data, we end up with this purple line. And you can see it is a lot more interpretable. You can clearly see the, the peak and that spike on the right-hand side <clears throat> of the graph. And at least I find it to be a lot more, uh, a lot easier to interpret and to make decisions with. So another thing we did was to provide the output of multiple models because no single model, it, it was hard to justify saying that this is the model you should be looking at when the models weren't consistent enough with their results. So what we found as a good stopgap was to provide, um, to show the output of many models. However, another step that we had to do because of this one was to calibrate their outputs. So we perform probability calibration so that our models are using the same scales, if you will. And this is important, once again, to interpret the output. If you had multiple models and they were in varying scales, it would be hard to say, why should I believe this model over that one, right? So continuing on this path, um, our models now tell a story. You can clearly see 
stable behavior, erratic behavior, upward and downward trends. You could see consensus among the models. So all of this helps someone understand what our models are trying to communicate about the data that they're looking at. Um, but we still needed an efficient way to display all of the information. And what we ended up doing was creating a heat map. And as you can see here on the right hand side, a heat map can be quickly skimmed. It is ideal for triaging a lot of data. However, once again, we run into more questions because of these decisions. At what threshold should we transition to red on a heat map, for instance? Here, uh, red does not mean 100% chance of failure. It actually means, I think, around 50%. But we chose that value to start transitioning to red because it, it would help guide the eyes of someone who was looking at this. And I, I feel like that level of care with the usability of these products we produce, um, these models, these analytic solutions, is something that really takes it a level up, you know? So this is um, pretty much the dashboard we created. This is an older version but it gives you the feel of what someone could expect and it allows them to drill down only to the data that really matters um, on the left you have a ranking of the models according to an average of the predictions on the middle you have the heat map and on the right you have the actual data on each of those selected um, pieces of equipment So to conclude, our stakeholders are pleased with the dashboard we have created. We're currently running a pilot to find out how the dashboard alters their workflow. And I'd say that the four things we learned through our journey was one, in-house development allows us to circumvent roadblocks. Two, the job to be done can determine if we can still reach our destination. Three, if data is uncertain, generalization is really all that matters. And finally, focus on the tool as a whole, not just the model behind it. So this is our team. And thank you. If you have any questions, please ask them. Thank you, Luis. Wow, a big virtual round of applause for him, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Go to some networking and stick around.